Hey everyone, my name is Kevin Ho and I'm going to be your lecturer for chapter 3, Proof of Work Mechanism Design. We're going to be covering the Bitcoin protocol, decentralized consensus, blockchains, proof of work, Merkle trees, buzzword, 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 and we're going to go into a little bit of the game theory and analyze the incentives of Bitcoin to see what kind of attacks it might be vulnerable to, like the selfish mining attack. Now, if you'll remember at the end of chapter two, we had this proof of authority network where every node in the network is really just a validator and they've elected a single authority to be the leader or proposer proposing the ordering of transactions for everyone to accept. Now, if someone wants to make a transaction, they'll send it to the authority. The authority will order it and sign it and he'll propagate it to all of the nodes to validate and to apply to their own ledger. Now, even if we have a network with multiple authority nodes, they can still become malicious either intentionally over time by wanting to extract rent from users or being compromised by hackers who want to double spend and censor on the network or a political entity like a government could take control of all of the authority nodes that reside in its jurisdiction and could control which transactions or which users get to transact on the network. When enough of the authority nodes are malicious, they can double spend on the network by reverting history and they can censor specific users. Now, two weak points of this protocol design are that there's no open access to participate to be one of these authorities. So you get this entrenched power where people can collude and potentially extract rent on users, and these authority nodes will become very publicly well known. So if a government wants to regulate or control them, it'd be very easy. And second, there's no in protocol penalties. So if an authority node tries to censor a user, there's no punishment for doing so. And if an authority node tries to revert history to double spend, the only punishment they might get is from a government, which is outside of the design space of this protocol. But there is another way to build this decentralized ledger. Rather than having everyone agree on an authority node, we can have decentralized consensus, where any of our nodes can participate and take turns being the authority node and proposing which transactions everyone should include in their ledger next. Now we can sort of visualize this as having sort of a spinner with everyone having an equal chance of getting picked. Whoever gets picked by the spinner becomes the next authority node. In this case, if Jing gets picked, she gets the temporary authority crown, and she gets to propose the next transaction, uh, which is this transaction of Alice sending money to Jing. So this will happen every round with, you know, let's say next round, Bob gets picked, and he gets the temporary authority hat and gets to propose the next transaction until, you know, everyone has a set of transactions. But we'll see pretty quickly that this protocol is very slow at adding new transactions to the ledger. So a way to improve this is using a data structure called the blockchain, where rather than proposing a single transaction to include next, you propose a block or a, a set of many transactions. Uh, and there's also this really nice property where every block has a dependency on the block before it, and that block has a dependency on the block before it, and that block has a dependency all the way back to the very first block. So if any data changes in the past, the most recent block and every block in front of it will no longer be valid. So this has a really nice property where as long as you all agree on the most recent block, uh, you're implicitly also agreeing on all of the blocks before it all the way to the very first block. So you can know that everyone has the same history uh, just from a single hash. So we'll learn more about decentralized consensus and the blockchain data structure in the next lecture, section 3.1. Now this decentralized consensus model of having every node have an equal chance of getting picked as the next authority node is good for explaining, but doesn't actually work in practice because uh, it's very easy to spoof up a node, uh, pretend like you have a different IP address and uh, get control of the network by having over 51% of a chance of being picked as the next authority node, as Mallory is doing here. Now, a solution to this attack was proposed in the Bitcoin white paper released by Satoshi Nakamoto in 2008, where he proposed proof of work as a way to prevent nodes from gaming that system. The idea was rather than giving everyone an equal chance of getting picked in the network based off of how many nodes they have, we instead pick the next authority or leader based off of how much computing power they have. And this is done using what's called hash puzzles. Using expensive hardware and lots of electricity to compute hashes over and over again. And the more hashes you can compute per second, the higher chance you have of being picked as the leader in the next round. And Bitcoin also introduced an interesting built-in incentive model, where because everyone's spending so much money on this hardware and electricity, uh, there's a built-in block reward in every block that pays money to the person who mined that block. And they also get money uh, from people trying to spend transactions uh, to get their transactions included sooner. 
So we'll be covering all the specifics of how Bitcoin really pioneered this model of decentralized consensus in Section 3.2 Nakamoto Consensus. In addition to using the blockchain data structure to store blocks of transactions, Bitcoin also uses a data structure called a Merkle tree to gather transactions within each block. Now the use case is consider we have a node that just has a small amount of computing resources, just you know a little smartphone to connect to the Bitcoin network, and you know connects to some peers and wants to transact. Uh, let's say someone wants to send them money for a song, and we store our transactions in this data structure called a Merkle tree, which is really just a binary tree where every pair of child nodes is hashed together to create their parent node all the way up to the very top. Now, if a malicious node wants to change something, change some transaction or something in history, uh, it's going to change all the hashes all the way up to the very root node, and we'll be able to detect that very easily. Now, the main benefit of using a Merkle tree is we only need log of the number of nodes in the tree in order to prove that some transaction is in a block. For example, if we have a block that's 16 megabytes large, we will actually only need 512 bytes in order to verify that some transaction is within that block. This lets someone with just a smartphone run the Bitcoin software and verify that transactions are included in the block, uh, what's called a light client. And we'll walk through this a lot more slowly and in depth in section 3.3, Merkle trees. Uh, so don't worry if you just got lost. <laughs> so Bitcoin's got this awesome decentralized consensus model uh, that's both censorship resistant and reversion resistant. Uh, without relying on some central authority or set of central authorities. Uh, but this relies on an honest majority assumption, meaning that a majority of computing power that's computing all these hashes for proof of work must be following the protocol honestly in order to have these properties of censorship and reversion resistance. You know, so how could it possibly be safe to just assume that a majority of this computing power is honest? Well, we need to really analyze the game of the Bitcoin protocol. So we can take a page out of the book of game theory and uh, look at all of these different aspects of the game of these miners computing proof of work. So, you know, who are the players in this game? Uh, what actions are available to them? You know, where do they build on the blockchain? Uh, what transactions do they include in every block? Um, you know, how soon after computing one of these hash puzzles do they reveal it to everyone? And, you know, what is the timing of their interactions? And this really plays into chapter two, like what is the connectivity network? What are our synchrony assumptions? And lastly, what are the payoffs as a result of the interaction? So, uh, you know, how much money did you make from transaction fees and block fees versus how much money did you spend on hardware and on electricity? So once we get a good idea for all the different aspects of this game and the different incentives within the game, we can do our best to predict what the behavior of each individual actor will be. Now we're going to go more in depth into game theory and analyzing Bitcoin in this framework in section 3.4, uh, Game Theory in Bitcoin. Now analyzing Bitcoin in this game theoretic way helps us come up with what kind of attacks Bitcoin might be vulnerable to. Now many people, especially in the early days of Bitcoin, might have believed that honest mining is a dominant strategy as long as you don't have a majority of power and can't uh, revert history or censor users. But in 2013, researchers from Cornell University uh, came up with an economic attack on Bitcoin that violates this assumption called selfish mining. And really just a quick overview of selfish mining, uh, the way it works is, you know, you have all these miners, uh, they're mining honestly, except for Mallory, who is a selfish miner. And once Mallory finds a block, uh, normally what an honest miner would do is publish it to the network and add it to the chain. But instead, she keeps it private and uh, keeps mining on top of that block. Now, if Mallory gets lucky and finds the next block, she'll wait until someone else in the network has found a block and then will publish her longer chain. Everyone always agrees that the longest chain is the canonical history, so that block that Alice had found is no longer included in history. So even though Alice spent a lot of money on electricity and hardware in order to produce that block, she doesn't receive any of the block rewards because her block was not included in the longest chain. So Alice is very sad, uh, and it turns out that in this case, all of the other miners that Mallory is making lose money lose more money than Mallory loses by doing this, you know, inefficient strategy. So even in the worst case in terms of network connectivity, if Mallory has 33% of the mining power, uh, she'll have 33% of the revenue from blocks. 
And as soon as that goes up a little bit more, uh, if Mallory has 40% of the mining power and is selfish mining, uh, she'll actually get 48% of the profits in terms of block rewards and transaction fees. Um, so this means that everyone else will either drop out because now they're losing too much money or they'll be convinced to go join Mallory until she actually has more than 51% of the mining power and can double spend and censor nodes. So we'll be talking more about this fascinating attack in section 3.5, Selfish Mining. Uh, so let's get started. 